Hello, listener, and welcome to this preview of our latest Patreon-exclusive episode. To continue the conversation and listen to the full episode, head over to the Beyond the Screenplay Patreon. The link is in the show notes. Hello, patrons, and welcome to this patron-exclusive episode of Beyond the Screenplay, the podcast where each episode we do a conversational deep-dive analysis into a film. Today, we are talking about The Killers of the Flower Moon, the 2023 film directed by Martin Scorsese, screenplay by Eric Roth and Martin Scorsese, based on the book of the same name by David Gran. I'm joined by the Beyond the Screenplay team, Trisha Rand. Hello, everyone. Brian Bittner. Hello, hello. And Alex Cayeros. Hi. Okay, so here we are. We're in week three of our Atur Autumn season. Uh, last week, we talked about Shutter Island, an older-ish Scorsese film. Uh, and this week, we're diving into his latest. Next week, we will be beginning our comparison of Sofia Coppola's work. So next week will be Virgin Suicides, and then followed up by uh, Priscilla. I, for some reason, I always want to say Bianca, which doesn't make any sense. Okay. No. Um, <laughs> so, That's not someone. <laughs> it's a different... Someone else's name. Uh, okay, so uh, The Killers of the Flower Moon. Let's let's get into it. So, the, so I'm just going to talk through my experience of this movie really quick. Okay. And so the first 90 minutes of this movie, I was super, super into it. I was like enthralled i feel like it was not it was the kind of scorsese that i like and to hold up a counter comparison wolf of wall street is the kind of scorsese that doesn't work for me where i feel like it was long and indulgent and just kind of the same plot beat over and over again for a really long time the first 90 minutes of killers of the flower moon i thought was really well executed it balances a lot of tricky things in a way that I thought was really like graceful and, and well executed. You know, it's it's a true story. It's a true crime story. So you have to sort of be respectful, but it also has to be a movie. It has to be entertaining. There's a lot of ways you could uh, choose the wrong perspectives and kind of make it about the wrong things. And I feel like it, to me anyway, seemed to navigate all of that in a really graceful and entertaining way. I feel like the goal of just bringing to attention and awareness, uh, you know, something horrible that happened that had sort of been relegated to a footnote in history, you know, continuing what the book did. I think this film is very much sparking conversation and has me way more aware of things than I would have otherwise. So there's a lot of things that I really, really love about this movie. Somewhere around the past 90 minute mark where there's still another two hours left, it felt like it started to shift away from some of the things that I was really enjoying and sinking into a little bit of that comfortable Wolf of Wall Street, for lack of a better phrase, place for me, where it was kind of the same story beat over and over and we're just sort of watching the same thing happen slowly over time. The movie does get this jolt of Jesse Plemons that happens, <laughs> uh, which is exciting. Uh, but I feel like even that wasn't, I, I don't know, it got me excited for things that then the movie didn't end up executing on the way that I thought it was going to. So, and then the movie's just, it's just really long. It's three and a half hours long. Mm. And I feel like it didn't need to be that long or could have done other things with that time. But again, we're getting into like, it's a true story. So how much do you manipulate events to be entertaining? So... That's kind of my overture of this movie, where like overall, I think it's really, really well made. I really liked a lot of it. By the end, I was mostly fatigued, but I think there's really great things in here. The end. Uh, and a lot of, I think, auteur things that we can talk about to extract and compare both the Shutter Island and all of Scorsese's filmography, obviously. Um, Trisha, I want to hear from you. What are your thoughts on this movie? Yeah, so I came in braced for the runtime and was not like overall, I was familiar with the story. 
and I was familiar with the people involved in like the, the three central leads. Um, Lily Gladstone was the star of one of my favorite movies at Sundance last year, which is a film called Fancy Dance. And I was obsessed with it and her in it. And I was like, yes, here's her time. She's going to get all the Oscar nominations and let like, let's go. Um, and, uh, but you know, knowing Scorsese, I was like, okay, here we go. It might be a bit of a slog. And honestly, sitting in the theater and during the experience, I was riveted. Um, I was with my friend, Anna. We were both like, okay, we're going to pee at different times and tell each other what happened when we were gone. (laughs) And neither one of us went to the bathroom at all. Like we sat there and we were like on the edge of our seats basically the entire time. Um, Overall, I think the movie is triumphant. I really, really enjoyed it. I think it does a lot of things very, very well. And overall tells an important story that has never been told, I think, um, from, you know, uh, one of our greatest masters ever, uh, and who is still very much in command of his craft, even at his age. And I think his whole sort of thing here, um, where he's like, you know, the central characters are the bad guys, basically, actually kind of works in this really deep thematic way and and on this meta level as well in the narrative. So there's a lot of like what Scorsese brings to this that I think is a perfect fit with the material. Um, and so walking out of it, I was like elated. I was like, this is probably one of my new favorite Scorsese movies. I am just so happy it exists. Like bring on Oscar season, give them all the awards. I'm here for it. I love it. Um, thinking back on it a few days later, I think you can cut an hour out of this movie. Um, and I wish that Marty had done that, but even so I still am like really, really on board with it. And I still feel the same way basically about the leads, about Scorsese, um, and about a lot of the other aspects of the filmmaking that I think all kind of come together here. I think the themes are great. Again, Scorsese's whole like, I love terrible people and I'm going to make movies about them. Love is a strong word, but like I gravitate towards making movies about terrible people. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at with the Wolf of Wall Street thing, Michael. I don't think that always works for me. And when it's like a mafia dude or, you know, a Wolf of Wall Street person, I'm kind of like, I don't know why I need this um, or it doesn't mean anything to me personally. But here, I think it's really in service of the story and of overall um, this invitation that I think is really personal to Scorsese for people to see themselves in the movie. We can get into more of that later, but like a lot of basically just the entire approach to it, the performances, the structure pretty much like all of it really works. I just think you could trim a lot out of it but it's still awesome at the end of the day for me. But it also checks a lot of my personal boxes. I'll also admit (laughs) that. It's a historical story. It's got this, um, you know, native history angle to it that I think is super important. That is the rarity of seeing that portrayed on screen. Like story worlds matter. And this is not a story world that we get to explore very much or see very much. I think that's a really big thing for me. Lily Gladstone was as amazing as I thought she was going to be. So like, Overall, I'm just like, yes, I love it. <laughs> nice. Yeah, cool. Okay. Uh, Alex, what about you? It's interesting because you know, I was sitting next to you in the theater, Michael, and I always wonder sometimes, like, is there some unconscious energy transference of like, we can hear the other person shifting in their seat. And so it's like, yeah, I am kind of bored right now <laughs> because my journey tracks with yours pretty one to one. Um, and you know, thinking about this movie, I saw the trailers for it and I love that this movie had great trailers and I felt from the trailers, you know what? Like I don't resonate always with Scorsese films, but this looks like a Scorsese film for me. And like Michael was saying during the first 90 minutes, or I didn't really track the time for a good chunk of it. I was like, I was correct. This is, is a Scorsese film for me. I love seeing this historical moment uh, just brought to life so vividly. Um, the way those early scenes are shot, really establishing like the town, 
the parties, like the, just like the slice of life was so rich and so like confidently done. I just love being immersed in a historical period by a master like Scorsese. And you just, you just feel like you're in such good hands. And, and I, and the story is such an interesting story that I'd never heard about before until this movie and this book had come out. So I was really on board and really excited and I was thinking, I was like, I'm going to take my husband to see this. My parents would love this movie. Like, I'm going to recommend it to all these people. And then the longer it went on, I'm like, oh, actually, I don't think he can do this movie. It's, it's <laughs> it just keeps going. And like my parents, they're probably going to fall asleep. Oh, crap. And so I had this feeling of like, I was like ready to evangelize this movie. And then the longer it went on, the more it was like a sinking feeling of, oh, damn, like it's not is not staying in the place that I thought it was going to stay. And now I'm kind of sad. And, and the, and the place that it went is, I think I identified this, the same thing as Michael, where it felt like this is how I have felt in other Scorsese movies that I have not resonated with, where it does feel like, um, there's not dynamics happening. There's kind of mm. like a, it's, you know, he, he's often doing these kind of like downfall descent, plots of a kind of a tragic anti-hero getting their comeuppance yada yada and i think a danger with that plot arc for a for a protagonist is that there's just kind of one direction you can go in and just things happen that just go further and further in that direction without a lot of ups and downs twists and turns changes in direction and so it's just tough like i think I, I there's plenty of movies with that kind of tragic trajectory that I like, but when it's stretched out over two full hours, like after the other hour and a half, <laughs> it's just like, I don't need, like you said, Trisha, I think you can cut an hour out of this movie easily and retain all of its potency, all of its story, meaning all of the, the most important beats. Um, and you can imply things that you can imply scenes or show in montage, you know, sequences that were drawn out in full here. Um, so, so I left, I left a little bit frustrated because I was excited to evangelize this new movie to everybody I knew. And then I started to realize, Oh, this will have to come with an asterisk of like, yeah, but you're going to have to be okay with like being pretty patient because this is three and a half hours long and it doesn't have to be like, there are some movies like Titanic, you can recommend to everybody because that movie is thoroughly entertaining dynamics up the wazoo twists and turns reversals every scene constantly for three hours this is not one of those movies and so and that's that is part of scorsese's thing and it is a thing that i struggle with because i see what a masterful filmmaker he is what command of craft he has and yet i don't find myself enthralled through the end of a lot of his movies i, I usually fall off at a certain point um, and that's just my, my eternal Scorsese struggle. And it has not been <laughs> solved by this film. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that some more. Um, Brian, what about you? Uh, loved it overall. Um, and I, for me, I, I feel like Scorsese always, his movies feel like 30% shorter than the runtime to me. Like, you know, this movie felt like a long movie, but it felt like a two and a half hour movie to me. It didn't feel like a three and a half hour movie to me. The Irishman felt like a three hour movie to me, not a four hour movie. And I, I think there's something about it. I, you know, kind of in Trisha's camp where I'm just like, I'm just engaged almost the entire time. Like every individual scene is engaging. And then there's usually a dramatic question that I'm looking, you know, engaged from scene to scene. Um, there is some stuff in the middle, and I think it's probably where you guys started to fall off that I think we can get into, where, where there's a little bit of a dramatic question thing going on. Um, and uh, but, but it was, you know, I don't know, it was maybe 20 minutes of three and a half hours for me where I was like, oh, I feel a little maybe like lost right now. But I was, but then it kind of got back into it. Um, and yeah, there's just something. One, there is something about if you know you're going in for a long movie, you can just settle in, you know, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, Scorsese recently was like, look, you assholes will like watch six hours of television in one sitting. It's like, why can't you watch a three and a half hour movie? And I'm like, yeah, I, I, I agree in theory. A movie takes a different kind of energy, right? Not but, wrong, but also we need to pee, Marty. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and also TV episodes are an hour long and have a structure with like ex exactly. reversal cliffhanger. You got to come back for yeah. more like is guaranteed every hour. Right. There's a different yeah. kind of energy. Uh, like, you know, 
I wouldn't want to watch five movies in 10 hours, but I could watch 10 hours of one season of TV. You know, like it's just a different kind. I get all that. But there is something about just being like, I am committing my evening to just doing this. And I I can, for me, I'm able to just sort of settle into that and go like, okay, I'm I'm happy to just like be on this ride for as long as it, as long as it is. Um, And, and yeah, there's just something about the feel of Scorsese movies that I just really love that just really works for me. And I just like, we can talk about some of the stuff that you guys talked about, but it's just like the editing and the directing and the production design and the performances. And, you know, generally speaking, the plot, I'm just like, this guy is going places. Like he, he knows how to make a, you know, pretty good movies, I think. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I am not like saying this is the best movie ever made necessarily, but I think it is, I think it's really, really excellent. And I was just enjoying myself the entire time, really. Yay. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. So I think there's a lot and I'm, I want to check in, remind me at the end of this, because I'm curious to see if if opinions travel over the course of the conversation, which sometimes happens. And I feel like this movies like this, where we have this kind of energy to it, that sometimes happens. Um, so I want to check in on that. I Yeah, so dramatic question stuff, I think is a really cool topic to bring up, Brian. I definitely want to talk about that perspective also and the perspective from which you tell a story. I think this is an interesting case to study for that. Which um, changed, by the way, in the making of the, in the writing of the script, so we can get into that. Mm. Let's definitely do that. Yeah, and and then also just like, like adaptations and dynamics, like you were saying, Alex, and reversals, but with true stories, like I think all, there's a lot of fascinating stuff in this, in this to get into. So, uh, so let's do it. Hope you enjoyed this preview clip. To continue the conversation and listen to the entire episode, head over to the Beyond the Screenplay Patreon. The link is in the show notes.